anytime uh, some type of an adaptive system is performing any type of a function, you end up seeing this graph, this sigmoidal shaped curve. And what this is representing is a response on that system's part to changes in the values of the input and the output. It, it is resistant, as we may see. And it's not just limited to biochemistry. For example, you know, if, if I were to show a pH titration curve, you see a sigmoidal shape on that. If I were to show a child's growth, well, you know, they start off really small and then they hit puberty and then they pretty much stop growing at that point. That's a responsive system. But in this context, I'm going to talk about the sigmoidal curve as an adaptive response in biochemistry. And it's usually enzymatic activity or other types of protein activity, but we'll just go ahead and represent it as an enzyme. So again, we have this function as substrate concentration here versus the velocity, and you've seen this graph over and over and over again. What it really is, what we're really representing here, is a combination of two things. The first is the T state, which is just a linear straight line here. This is what we get if we keep it locked in the T state. And if we were to say, let's graph the R state, that is much more hyperbolic-like, much more Michaelis-Menten uh, in nature. And so what we get here in this, in this center here, I'm going to say this red, is a combination of those two things. And there's two models that we have that adequately explain the observed sigmoidal nature of enzyme kinetics. There's the concerted model and then the sequential model. So I'm going to start off talking about the sequential model. And in the sequential model, what happens is the binding of one substrate induces a conformational change in the neighboring subunits that it makes them more open to accepting that substrate. So they're more so to be shift to the R state. So the binding of the substrate causes a conformational change which makes the other subunits switch to the R state. Just to give you guys a brief little illustration of what that looks like, let's just say that we have quaternary level uh, enzyme complex here and these are all initially in, we'll say, the T state. But when the substrate binds, I'm just going to abbreviate that as S here, this substrate is going to undergo a conformational change in this subunit which is going to cause the two adjacent units to also undergo a conformational change, which makes them switch to the R state so that more substrates can bind. And when these substrates bind, this final one undergoes a conformational change, which switches it over to the R state. And this enables it to respond to various amounts of substrate concentration. It's not an enzyme, but hemoglobin is a really good representation of the sequential model. So for example, it would be hemoglobin. The other model that equally accounts for this sigmoidal curve is called the concerted model. And to be honest with you, I don't actually like the concerted model because it's not um, as mechanistic as a sequential model. We understand the sequential model in the context of conformational changes and things like that. This is much more of an explanation, whereas the concerted model is really more so just a description. But there are certain contexts, and I don't really want to go into this, but the underlying mathematics for each of these is different, and you'll have certain contexts where you'll graph the substrate concentration with the velocity. Um, for example, we'd say ATKs. Uh, if we graph the substrate concentration with the velocity, those points actually adhere more closely to the sigmoidal graph in the concerted model than they do in the sequential model. But that's kind of beyond the point. So in the concerted model is where the binding of the substrate affects the probability of the entire enzyme. Okay, so the binding of the substrate affects the probability that the enzyme is in the T or R state. The entire quaternary super level enzyme is going to be in either the T or the R state. This is more so about the subunits. This is about the entire enzyme as a whole. And I'm just going to go ahead and down here in what little space I have left, draw out what that looks like. Okay, so I did not have room in uh, that last uh, concept map to draw this out. And so I just figured I'd go ahead and just insert an image of a screenshot. So up top we have the T state and then down here we have the R state. And when there is no substrate, it's like 99% T and then 1% R. Or you could think of it as the probability of observing it in the T state is 0.99 and 0 0.01 of observing it in the R state. And so really pay attention to the sizes of the arrows in this equilibriating process. So we have no substrate present, we observe our enzyme, our enzyme is in the T state. When one substrate binds, let's say that it's hemoglobin and oxygen binds, we still have the majority of the observations that we make are going to be in the T state. So say that it's, you know, I don't know, 25% uh, to be in the R and then 75% in the T. And then when the next substrate binds, it's 50% in the T and then 50% in the R. 
the whole enzyme here. I'm not talking about subunits here. I'm saying the probability, yeah, like in quantum mechanics, the probability of what we observe is, is present here. And so then by this point here, let's say that we have three substrates bound. It's like 20% T and 80% R. And then by the time we are at all the substrates bound, it is 100% R or 99% R and 1% in the T. And this is the model that explains the sigmoidal curve by using probability rather than mechanistically with conformational changes.